All right, so I'm going to be teaching today from my chapter uh, in the book that I, I did a while back. So this file is in the blood lab. I'm sure you clicked on it already. <clears throat> if you haven't, well, you had to because you had to do the heart and the blood vessel. So ultimately, the text information that we're going to be learning is out of here. At the very end, when we do blood typing, <clears throat> I'm going to have to pull up, I'm going to Google a picture uh, like I did yesterday. I found a good one. Hopefully the same one comes up because I didn't save it. That shows uh, how we type blood. So we're going to get into that at the very end. So ultimately, the blood is a liquid connective tissue you guys learned about in AMP1. It's composed of really two things. Is composed of a liquid portion that you know of as plasma, and then a cellular component, which are called the formed elements, which include red cells, white cells, and platelets. <clears throat> so I want you to know the basic functions of the blood. You have to excuse me today as well because I'm, I'm having an allergy thing. Um, so I'll put down here just some basic information about uh, the, the functions of the blood, but the blood does a lot more than this. You're going to be learning all of the functions in uh, the lecture class, in the lecture chapter, chapter 19 of the lecture book. But these are pretty basic. Everybody knows that the blood transports everything around the body. All the hormones that you guys just learned, you know, uh, nutrients from the foods that we eat, waste products from all the cells in the body, medicines that we might be taking, everything, respiratory gases, all circulating around the body in the blood. So the blood is transporting everything that all of our cells need in order to live and also delivering waste products where they have to go so our excretory systems can get rid of them. So the blood is doing all of that. Obviously, the heart pumps the blood. We learned that in the heart chapter. And the vessels in the body transport the blood where it needs to go. Arteries carry blood away from the heart, veins carry blood to the heart, all of that that we learned already. The blood is also involved in protecting us in several ways. Our blood, once we become infected with some pathogen or microbe, we have white blood cells that protect us. And there's a whole chapter on this protection mechanism. We have what you know of as immunity, <clears throat> That's referred to as specific resistance to disease. And we also have non-specific resistance to disease mechanisms. We're going to learn all of that in another chapter. I'm going to hint on some of that with some of the white blood cells that we cover. But not only do we have white blood cells to help eradicate pathogens from our body, our blood also clots itself. You guys know that. You cut yourself, the blood clots itself, and thus it prevents the loss of blood through a broken vessel. Um, the blood also regulates several things in our body. Thermal regulation, you learned at AMP1. What happens when you get hot? Well, you vasodilate the, the vessels in the skin. More blood goes to the surface of the body. You liberate more heat away from the body and it cools your body down. The opposite is true if you're cold. Vessels in the skin vasoconstrict allows less blood to get to the surface of the body, thereby maintaining the heat in the core of our body. The blood also can regulate its own pH to a degree. We're going to learn about blood pH and its regulation more so in an acid-base chapter later on in the semester. But you can see here, we have a very strict pH range for the blood on the pH scale, 735 to 745. So it's a pretty strict and tight range as far as a physiological limit is concerned in order to keep us healthy. So we have to maintain that pH or all sorts of systems can falter and we become unhealthy. And in some cases we can die. So we're gonna cover all of that in an acid base chapter later, later on. All right, so let's look at what blood is, what makes it up and then get into all of the cells. All right, <clears throat> so you can see here, I drew a little test tube. And if you put blood into that test tube, the whole test tube is red. Everybody knows that, right? You'll give blood, blood goes in a tube and the whole tube's red. So if we 
put this tube in a special machine that then spins around and around. Some of y'all know it already. It's called a centrifuge. You can separate the components of whole blood out. So this is what we call whole blood right here. Everything in there. Whole blood is composed of plasma. And by volume, it's about 55% of the volume of whole blood on average. And then all of the cellular components that make up the formed elements, which we're going to be learning. And that comprises about 45% by volume of whole blood. So once we spin that down, we can see three areas in a separated sample of blood. You can see the area where plasma is. That's all the top part. That's a, the liquid, the water with all the dissolved solutes uh, and every, you know, ions, electrolytes, uh, your antibodies, everything's all up here and, and dissolved in, in the plasma. But then we also have this little bitty area right here. It's called the Buffy coat. The Buffy coat is where the white blood cells and the platelets settle out of solution. And you can see it's just a little, little bitty volume right here, right? The largest volume of the formed elements is the red area. The red area is called the packed cell volume. And the packed cell volume is basically all of the red blood cells. So since there's the majority of the formed elements in whole blood are red blood cells, they take up the majority of that 45% of all of the formed elements. So the number of red blood cells that we have per unit volume of blood is called the hematocrit. Now, we kind of interchange the packed cell volume and hematocrit, and for now, that's fine. But the hematocrit is a diagnostic measurement of how efficiently your body is, is maintaining and producing red blood cells, number one, but also how well your blood is carrying oxygen around the body. And so I'm about to get into some of that, right? So the formed elements, erythrocytes or red cells, you know that, leukocytes or white blood cells, and then platelets, I didn't put the little term here, but platelets are, are also called thrombocytes. You may or may not have heard of that before, but they're called thrombocytes. So let's look at the differences between hematocrits, normal, low, and high hematocrits and a little bit about what that means. So what I did here is I generated uh, those same test tubes. I changed the volume of the red cell, the packed cell volume at the bottom to demonstrate with tube A, what I am calling a normal hematocrit. So what is a normal hematocrit? Well, it's a little different from males to females given the body size, but normal hematocrit in males have a range of 40 to 54. Now, you don't have to go memorize these ranges, but I, I would like for you to know the averages. So the average for an, a male, an average size male, will be about 45% of the total volume. For females, it ranges 38 to 47%. So the normal, you know, average hematocrit for a female of a comparably size would be about 42%. The main difference between these numbers, higher in males and, than in females, is due to testosterone. So males have more androgens than females do, but that's neither here nor there. So this, this tube A represents the normal range for males and females. Um, and also, just to let you know, I, when I drew these things out, I didn't measure this to make sure it was 45% of the whole volume. But I'm calling tube A normal. And then to B, you can see has very little or a lower amount of red cells in it, packed cell volume. So the hematocrit is low. So when the hematocrit is low, somebody has anemia. Everybody knows what anemia is, right? Anemia is where a person has a decreased oxygen carrying capacity of their blood. Now that can be attributed to a couple of things. One, it could be due to a low hematocrit. 
if you don't have enough red cells, you can't transport enough oxygen. But, but when someone is anemic, they may also have a problem with the amount of hemoglobin. So that's beyond the scope of this particular presentation to get into, but somebody can have a low hemoglobin count as well. All right. But for now, anemia represented by a low hematocrit, which is tube B. Tube C here represents the fact that someone has a, a high hematocrit. They have too many red cells per unit volume of blood, and that is what we call polycythemia. So that means you have too many red cells. And you might think, hey, that's pretty good. Because the more red cells you have, the more oxygen you can deliver. Well, that is true to an extent, but the problem with that, as we learned in the blood vessel chapter, is that if you increase the number of red cells or cells in general per unit volume of blood, the blood viscosity increases. And if the blood viscosity increases, then the total peripheral resistance increases, which puts an extra hard workload on the heart. And ultimately that could kill you. So um, a long, long, long time ago now, aerobic athletes in the Olympics, some, some of them died, they were cyclists. Because what they did a long time ago was something called blood doping. And blood doping is where an aerobic athlete, a cyclist, runner, or swimmer, takes blood out of their body and freezes it. And then just before an athletic event, they take the blood, they thaw it out, and they inject it back in their body. So essentially what they're doing when they do that is they're in artificially inducing a polycythemic event to increase their hematocrit to increase a number of red cells that can transport oxygen. And, you know, some of those athletes died because it put too much of a workload on the heart and they went into cardiac arrest and went into heart failure. So these are just different scenarios, normal, low and high hematocrits. And I just wrote a couple of little, you know, small paragraphs right here dealing with that. Oh, I'm glad I looked here. I want you to know what EPO is. EPO, erythropoietin is the hormone that causes the production of red blood cells. That hormone is produced by the kidneys, by the way. And so it acts at red, at red bone marrow, at a specific cell in there that we're, you're gonna deal with in lecture, and it causes red cells to be produced. So EPO is the name of that hormone that induces red blood cell production. All right, let's talk about the leukocytes, the white blood cells. There are five major classes of white blood cells, by the way. And those five classes of white blood cells can be separated into two different groups. So they're either considered to be what we call granulocytic cells or agranulocytic cells. So notice that the change in the word here, I can say granulocyte the granulocytes. And when you say granulocyte, you don't have to say the word cell after it because C-Y-T-E on the end means cell anyway. But if you say granulocytic with I-C on the end, that means pertaining to something. You have to say what you're pertaining to. You're pertaining to the cells. So you, this, this is the correct verbiage here. You, you would say granulocytic cells or you would say, oh, a neutrophil is a granulocyte. That's how you would verbalize that. Same thing with the agranulocytic cells. They are also called agranulocytes. So there are three granulocytic cells, neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. There are two major classes of agranulocytes, monocytes and lymphocytes. And so the next section I wanna do is start talking about these cells. We're gonna start with the granulocytic cells tell you a little bit about them. And since I have these little pictures here, you can see it better with this one, but which are the eosinophils. But look at, at this picture of this cell right here. You can see all of these little round things in the cytoplasm of the cell. Those are called granules. 
They're basically secretory vesicles that contain chemicals. The granulocytic cells are called granulocytic because they have numerous conspicuously staining granules in their cytoplasm that we can, can visualize or see under the microscope. You can see them. So the difference between granulocytic cells and agranulocytic cells is that the granulocytes have many more granules and those granules are, well, the cells are dependent on those granules in order to do their job. So when a granulocyte is activated, all of a sudden they start to exocytose out all the chemicals from all these little granules, but it happens all at one time. So when you have a mass amount of exocytosis from a granulocyte, that's called degranulation. And I put that word up here in a little introduction. So the granulocytic cells, in order to do their job, they basically have to degranulate and dump out a whole bunch of chemicals somewhere. And we're going to go over a couple of those, not all of them, but a couple. The difference with agranulocytic cells is that they don't have all those granules in their cytoplasm. They have a few, you know, the term agranulocytic, by the way, means without granules. So it's kind of a misnomer because they do have some granules in there. You can see the little dots in there. But the difference is, is that these agranulocytic cells do not rely on the exocytosis of chemicals from these granules in order to do their jobs. So that's a big difference. All right, so let's start with the neutrophils. Neutrophils are the most numerous of the white blood cells, by the way. If you do what's called a differential blood cell count on somebody and under normal conditions, the neutrophil would be the highest. Now, the thing about the white blood cells is this. White blood cells increase in number depending on what's going on in the body. For instance, if you have a bacterial infection, you should suspect that your neutrophil count will go up because neutrophils are fairly effective against bacteria. If you have a, a, a major allergy attack or you have a parasitic worm infection or you have some other major inflammatory response going on, sooner or later, about a couple of weeks later, the eosinophil count goes up. If you're in an active inflammatory response, the basophils go up. In viral infections, certain lymphocytes go up, so forth and so on. So depending on what's going on in the body, different white cells increase in number. Now, an increase in white cell count under normal conditions, depending on what's going on in the body, is, is a good thing. We want them to go up because they're going to help us eradicate the problem, the pathogen, whatever's going on in the body. But a decrease in white blood cell count is never good if they decrease. And I'll give you a, a little example of that. Everybody knows about AIDS and HIV, and HIV infects a certain cell in the body, um, and it kills it. It compromises the immune system. That's why it's called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So what does it do? Well, that virus kills off a whole bunch of lymphocytes. So their numbers go down and it compromises your immune response. So when the numbers go down, that's never good. Just to let you know that. All right. So let's look at the neutrophils and go through them one at a time. And, and look, when you're home studying, you don't have to go look up any more information unless you're interested in doing that for this test. You're going to learn a little bit more about them in lecture but at least learn what I put in these little paragraphs. I didn't write a whole lot about them. I just wrote some essential uh, material, but neutrophils really kill bacteria in a couple of ways. Neutrophils are phagocytic. They can perform phagocytosis, but that's not their primary role. They can gobble up some bacteria, but they also have all these little granules in their cytoplasm. You can barely see them in there, but they have them. I'll tell you why in a second. But in their granules, 
when they degranulate and dump out their chemicals, they're dumping out strong oxidants like bleach and hydrogen peroxide. I gave you a couple of examples that you are familiar with. You guys know hydrogen peroxide. You get a cut, you put some hydrogen peroxide on it. You're cleaning the wound out, right? You use bleach at home to clean everything up. Well, neutrophils can make hydrogen peroxide and bleach. It's kind of crazy. Um, they also release a, a very reactive oxygen-free radical called superoxide anion. It's basically an oxygen molecule with an extra electron on it. That's why it takes on this negative charge. And it's very reactive. And it's a very strong oxidant. So I don't know if you remember what oxidation is. But oxidation is where electrons get stripped away from uh, molecules. And when you take electrons away from a molecule, it becomes unstable. So if that's happening to DNA and protein in a cell, the cell's not going to live very long. So that actually kills cells. Oxidation can kill cells. So neutrophils are doing that. All right. Now, how are we going to be able to identify these cells? So not only do we have to know a little bit about what they do, you're going to have to be able to identify them. And instead of just memorizing over oh, the coloration or this and that, I want to tell you how you know what the cell is. So how would I know that this is a neutrophil? Well, this is one of the easiest ones to identify, by the way. All white blood cells have nuclei, have, have a nucleus. Mature red blood cells do not have a nucleus. So white blood cells have nuclei and their nucleus take their nuclei take on particular shapes. So look at the neutrophil, the model of the neutrophil right here. It looks like there's multiple little bitty bubbles in there. These are the lobes of the nucleus. So a neutrophil is also called polymorpho nuclear cells or in the lab they just call them polys what's the poly count so the reason why they're called polymorpho nuclear cells is this poly means many you know that morpho means shape and nuclear just means the nucleus so these cells have three to five lobes on its nucleus as soon as you see multiple lobes in there you know you're looking at a neutrophil. That's the easiest way to do it. The other thing is this. Inside of the granules, in the granulocytes, are various types of chemicals. So those chemicals take on different types of stain when we go to stain them. And they can take up an acidic stain or a basic stain, or both. And as it turns out, neutrophils take up both acidic and basic stains. So acids cancel the bases out, it neutralizes them. So that's why they're called neutrophils and their granules kind of appear clear. Sometimes they have a little coloration to them, but some of them kind of look clear because the, the stains cancel out, right? So the shape of the, set, the nucleus and the staining pattern of these cells is gonna be your identifying character. So neutrophils, multiple lobes, right? Eosinophils have red to orange staining granules in their cytoplasm because the types of chemicals that they have in their granule take up an acidic stain called eosin, thus the name eosinophil. So they take up that acidic stain eosin and it stains them red or orange. But the other identifying character for a mature eosinophil is that they always have a bilobed nucleus. Looks like there's two little lobes in there. Sometimes you don't even see the little nuclear filament in it, and it looks like they have two separate nuclei, but it's really only one because the two lobes are interconnected right here. All right, so eosinophils, what do they do, right? Well, they release strong oxidants like neutrophils do, but they also release toxic proteins and toxic substances that can destroy pathogens like parasitic worms. They release neurotoxins. They also release enzymes that can 
basically dampen out inflammatory responses. The enzyme that I want you to know is histaminase. Histaminase is an enzyme that breaks down histamine. And anybody in the class that has allergies know what histamine is because you have to go take Benadryl, which is the histamine blocker, right? So ultimately, if you can break down histamine or block it, you basically decrease inflammation in the body, all right? Because histamine is one of the several classes of inflammatory compounds. So you could think of eosinophils as anti-inflammatory cells as well, because they like to dampen out or decrease inflammation. But they also are fairly effective at getting rid of allergens and getting rid of, or at least destroying parasitic worms. So if somebody had a previous allergy attack or they were infected with a, a parasitic worm, like an intestinal worm, maybe the pinworm. You guys all know the pin, probably heard of the pinworm before. That's a little worm that kids get when they go to daycares and stuff. Um, Enterobius vermicularis is the pinworm. So we said if someone has that and you did a differential blood count, their eosinophils will probably be higher than normal. And then the doctor will think, well, did you have an allergy attack? Uh, you know, we need to test your stool. We might have a parasitic worm infection. Of course, they won't say that. They'll just do a stool test, but you get the point. So depending on what's going on in the body, these cells are going to increase. You have bacterial infection, neutrophils are going to increase. You have an allergy attack or, or in, inflammation in the body or a parasite infection, eosinophils will increase, so forth and so on. Basophils are the opposite cell to eosinophils. If one of the roles of eosinophils is to bring down inflammation, which is anti-inflammatory, basophils are inflammatory. Basophils try to increase inflammation, right? So basophils have these very dark blue, black, or purple, very conspicuous dark granules in their cytoplasm. And these are also the least numerous of the white blood cells under normal conditions. So basophils actually release inflammatory compounds during times of inflammation. And I guess I should tell you, inflammation is not all bad. Every time we hear the word inflammation, we think, ooh, that's bad. Inflammatory responses are normal responses to tissue trauma in some way to help repair the tissue. It's just that if inflammatory responses are very heightened or uncontrolled is when it gets bad. So basophils in their granules release inflammatory compounds like histamine, heparin, leukotrienes. This, these are just three major groups. There's a few other ones and they bring about an inflammatory response. So basophils normally increase in number when you have tissue trauma and we have to have inflammation, and then due to several other uh, diseases like chicken pox, they can go up, uh, sinus infections, diabetes mellitus, those types of things, right? You don't have to go and memorize all of this. I'm not gonna put that on a test. This is just for you to, to know when we have inflammatory responses increase. All right, let's talk about the agranulocytic cells. The agranulocytes include the lymphocytes and the monocytes. There is limited information in this chapter on the lymphocytes because I'm just introducing them to you because we have to do a whole lab just on them. There's a whole lab on these cells. It's in the lymphatic system where we cover their physiology. For now, it's sufficient for you to know that there's two major groups of lymphocytes. There are subpopulations of them, but there's two major groups. We have what are called T lymphocytes or T cells for short and B lymphocytes or B cells for short. These lymphocytes are basically your immune system cells. These are the cells that bring about immune responses or what we call specific 
resistance to disease, right? Now, T cells are very effective on one side of our in, in immune responses at killing off cells directly. So T cells can go and kill off infected cells in our body. Say you have cells infected with a virus. The T cells are gonna go try to kill that cell. Or your own cells that become cancerous, T cells try to go and eradicate them, get rid of it out of the body. B cells are the cells that produce antibodies during what's called antibody mediated immunity. And when a B cell is activated, they turn into what's called a plasma cell. I want you to know this word. B cells turn into plasma cells and the plasma cells are what produces antibodies and secretes them. So activated B cells are plasma cells that make antibodies, which are produced against very specific antigens or disease causing agents that we're gonna learn about in the lymphatics chapter. Monocytes are the largest of the white blood cells. They're phagocytic. They have a horseshoe shaped nucleus. So whenever you see that horseshoe shape, you know you're looking at a monocyte and they're relatively large compared to the other cells um, by volume. And these cells, like many of the other white blood cells, which I forgot to talk about, have the ability to actually leave our blood vessel. So you could think the blood cells obviously circulating in blood inside of a blood vessel, but at capillary beds and the small veins called venules, white blood cells can squeeze out of a blood vessel and get into a tissue, which is kind of interesting. When a bl white blood cells squeeze out of those small blood vessels and get into tissues, that's called immigration. And we say that the white cell has immigrated into a tissue. So the reason why I'm telling you that is this, when the white cells immigrate into tissues, like a monocyte, they change what they look like and they change what they do. They're becoming activated in the tissue. Monocytes happen to turn into macrophages when they immigrate. So I'm sure you heard of that term several times up, up until now. So monocytes, when they immigrate into a tissue, basically develop into a macrophage. Monocytes are found in circulating blood. Macrophages are found in tissues. And macrophages are the largest of the phagocytes in the body. They predominantly perform phagocytosis. These are the little nurses in the body, by the way, that keeps everything sterile. They gobble everything up via phagocytosis. So out in the tissues, the macrophages are constantly gobbling up bacteria or other pathogens trying to cause infection. Um, they gobble up your own cells that are dead or dying. And if you cut yourself, they clean up the wound site. So these are our little nurses in our body that keep everything clean for us. Um, and they develop from monocytes. Now on the test, you're gonna have to be, on the practical, you're gonna have to be able to identify the white cells and, and the other formed elements. But the reason why I say white cells is because the little red discs are red blood cells. Everybody knows that. You might not know what these little, little blue looking pieces are right here, but those are platelets. So all on this little plaque model right here, all of those little pieces of, that doesn't even look like a cell, the little pieces of substances there, those are platelets. Platelets, also called thrombocytes, are involved in blood clotting. I think you know that. So obviously people don't get these wrong. You point to the red thing, it's a red blood cell, the erythrocyte but we have to learn how to identify the white cells. Well, let's go by what we just talked about. If we see, a, first of all, all of the cells that have nuclei are always white blood cells, right? Mature red blood cells do not have a nucleus. And platelets aren't even a whole cell at all. It's a little bitty piece of a, of a cell that stays in the red bone marrow. So here's a cell with a nucleus. I know this is a basophil because it has all them little blue dots on it. So the dark blue dots, blue, black, or purple, signify that it is a basophil. Those are our inflammatory cells, if you remember that I just talked about. The cells that have a, that are relatively small, 
and have a pretty much complete round circular nucleus or lymphocytes. Now, depending on which lymphocyte we're looking at and what stage of development or activation they're in, they do take on different appearances. So what we're looking at here is what's called a typical small lymphocyte. There's one there, there's one here, and there's one here. I know these are all lymphocytes, number one, because they have a large round nucleus that takes up almost the whole inside of the cell. So this small lymphocyte here and this one over here, you could barely even see the cytoplasm in there. Just on the, a little ring of cytoplasm around the nucleus. That's what we call a small lymphocyte. But those are lymphocytes with a round nuclei in them. The ones that have multiple lobes on its nucleus are, yep, you guessed it, polys, neutrophils. They have three to five lobes on their nucleus. The one, the cells that have a horseshoe shaped nucleus here and here, those are monocytes with a horseshoe shaped nucleus. The ones that have a bilobe nucleus with the little orange dots inside of them, the granules are red or orange, those are eosinophils. So that's how you're going to be identifying these things. And here, just some more models of them. Obviously, you see the red blood cell down here. Here's a typical small lymphocyte where the nucleus takes up almost the entire inside of the cell. Here's a monocyte with a horseshoe shaped nucleus. Basophils have these dark blue, black, or purple granules. Eosinophils have the little red, orange granules with a bilobe nucleus. And the neutrophils have multiple lobes on their nuclei, on the nucleus, all right? So you're gonna have to be able to identify that. Also, make sure, oh, somebody, hold on one second. Go back to this. Yeah, if you have a question, just unmute and holler at me. All right. Um, so let's get into blood typing. We have to learn the blood typing chart. I'm going to teach you about who can receive blood from whom without you having to memorize all of these letters everywhere, right? All the blood types. I'm gonna teach you how you can determine who can receive blood from whom only from this chart up here. And two extra statements I have to make you write down. But nonetheless, let's go through the ABO blood typing system. There's over 30 different blood typing systems though, by the way, because blood typing systems are based on the presence or absence of certain types of molecules in the membranes of the red blood cell. And those molecules in the membrane of the red blood cells are called antigens. The reason why we learn the ABO blood typing system is because it's the most medically relevant out of all of the systems. And the reason why I say that is this, if you give somebody the wrong type of ABO blood, you're going to kill them, or at best, you're, you're gonna make them sick. And they might not die, that would be good that they don't, but you're still gonna make them sick. So ultimately, we, we learn this because you cannot give somebody the wrong type of ABO blood. So as far as the blood types are concerned, and you might know a little bit about it already, just bear with me, we're gonna get into a little bit more information in a minute. You can be type A, B, A, B, or O. Now, these are the four basic types. There's technically eight types that we're going to get into. So let's look at what makes one blood type different from another one. In order for somebody to be type A, they have to have the A antigen in the membrane of their red blood cell. That also means that the person has to inherit the genes from their parents that produce the A antigen. So the antigens that we are referring to in the ABO blood typing system are called the A antigen and the B antigen. And that's it. This whole system is based on the presence 
or the absence of an A antigen or the B antigen. And antigens and their antibodies are very specific, by the way. I'm going to get into these in a minute. So in order for somebody to be type A, they have to have the A antigen. That's how simple it is. In order for somebody to be type B, they have to have the B antigen. Now we can be type AB. I'm sure there's somebody out there in the class that's AB. In order to be A, and that, the reason for that is because the genes for the, that code for the ABO uh, blood types are codominant. That means you can inherit an A gene from one parent and a B gene from the other parent, and you would produce both the A antigen and the B antigen. So it's a codominant inheritance pattern. So if you do have an A gene and a B gene, you're gonna make both of these antigens, in which case they're displayed and presented at the surface of all of your red blood cells, the A's and the B antigens, right? In which case, your type is called AB. Now, if you inherit a pair of genes that code for neither the A nor the B antigen, you would never display them at, your, at the surface of your red blood cell. And that pair of genes is called the null gene or the I gene. Some books call it the O gene. But nonetheless, if you inherit that, those genes from your parents, and you have to be homozygous for it, that means you have to inherit an I gene from each parent. You won't produce the A or the B antigen. So you don't present them at the surface of your red blood cell. And since you're not presenting the A nor the B antigen at the surface of your, of your red blood cell, your blood type is said to be O. That's how simple the ABO blood typing system really is. If you have A, you're type A. If you have B, you're type B. If you have both the A and the B antigen, you're type AB. If you have neither one, the A nor the B antigen, at the surface of your red blood cell, you're type O. That's how simple that is. Now, we have to learn which blood types can receive blood from the other blood types and which ones can't. Who can receive blood from whom, in other words? And Instead of memorizing a whole list of blood types for each blood type, all you really have to know is this. What type of antibody is in the person's plasma of their blood? The antibodies are in the plasma, by the way. They're in the plasma of the blood. Antigens are in the surface of the cell, in the plasma membrane. So in order to know what type of blood a, a blood type can receive, you have to know what type of antibody is in the plasma of that person's blood. So for instance, if you're type A, like I'm type A, I'm actually A positive. I'll get into positive and negative in a minute. But all A people have the A antigen in the membrane of their red blood cell, which means they don't have the B antigen and the B antigen is foreign. And our immune system produces antibodies against foreign antigens to eradicate them from the body. We don't want foreign antigens in our body. It's not ours, we don't want it. So everybody who is type A that does not possess the B antigen, the B antigen is a foreign antigen. And so in the plasma of their blood, they have anti-B antibodies. Now, what you never, ever, ever want to happen is to introduce blood into a person's body that will cause their antibody to react to their antigen, to, to the antibody's antigen. In other words, I never, ever, ever want to put any blood in an A person's body that has the B antigen on it. Because I never want this antibody to bind to anything. So I guess I need to tell you a little bit about what antibodies do. This is the shape of a, of a generic antibody, this little Y shape. Um, at the very tips of the Y up here is what's called the variable region. And these are the regions that actually bind and stick 
to their particular antigen that they're made against. Antibodies are very, very, very specific and can only ever bind to the antigen that they're produced against. So for instance, the anti-B antibody can only ever bind to the B antigen. It could never bind to the A antigen, ever. Likewise, the anti-A antibody, and you can see how I made the little shape right here, are very, very specific. They can only ever bind to the A antigen. Notice how it's a little circle, would fit in this little circle. So you never want to put any blood in a person's body that would cause their antibody to react to an antigen. That's called, by the way, a transfusion reaction, and you're killing your patient, okay? So I'm type A. All of my red blood cells have the A antigen in the surface. In the plasma of my blood, I have anti-B antibodies. So you could never, ever, ever put any blood in my body that has the B antigen on it. You can't put B blood in my body because it has the B antigen, and that B antigen would bind to my anti-B antibodies. That means I cannot donate blood to you because I'm type B. Yeah, you could never give blood to me. You would kill me. And you cannot give blood to me either. Correct. That is exactly right. So you also could not give an A person AB blood because it has the B antigen on it. You see what you're trying to avoid is a cross reaction with the antibody to their antigen. Because if you put a whole bunch of this blood in my body, the B blood, all of that blood would bind to all these antigens, I mean antibodies, and it would cross-link all the cells together and cause what's called agglutination. And you so would cause- So does, that, does that mean someone with um, a type A plus, can a type A plus give uh, a type A negative blood? No, I'm gonna get to that in one second. Okay. Right after I finish this basic talk, I'm gonna talk about positive and negative. So yeah, we're gonna deal, we're gonna deal with positive and negative in just one minute. So the point here is that you can't give anybody blood if they have that antibody. So you can't give any A person any blood with B on it because they have anti-B antibodies. Likewise, you can't give any B person any blood that has the A antigen on it because they have anti-A antibodies. You don't want that reaction occurring. So B people can't get A and they can't get AB because there's an A antigen on it. So if they can't get A and they can't get AB, that means B people can only get their own, which is B and O. A people cannot get B or AB. So A people can only ever get their own, which is A and O. But look at AB people. AB people don't have the, they have neither the anti-A nor the anti-B antibodies. And it's good they don't have them because they have both the antigen A and antigen B. If they had either one of these antibodies, they would just attack their own blood. So since they don't have A, anti-A nor anti-B antibodies, it doesn't matter if you give them A blood or B blood or their own or O. There's no antibodies to react to anything anyway. So AB people can get A, they can get B, they can get their own AB, and they can get O. But look at O people. O people have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. You know why? Because they don't have a antigens nor B antigens, which means the A and the B antigen is foreign to them. So since they have both anti-A and anti-B, you can't put any blood in their body that has A on it or B on it. So you know what that leaves them? They can only get O. All right, so let's talk about Mercy's question earlier. What makes positive and negative blood types and who can receive from whom with that, right? So we know the basis of it now. A people can only get A and O. B people can only get B and O. A, B people can get all of them. And O people can only get O. Pretty simple. 
So let's just put a twist on it right now. What makes positive and negative? Well, another antigen. So there is another antigen besides A and B. It's called the RH antigen. And if you have it in the surface of your red blood cell, your blood type is said to be a positive one. So for instance, on this little picture that I made, this person's red blood cell has an A antigen in it, and it has an RH antigen, which means this person is A positive. However, over here, this person's red cells have the A antigen, but no RH. So if you don't have the RH antigen, your blood type is just said to be negative. That's how simple that is. You either have it or you don't. So I'm A positive, I said that earlier. That means all of my red blood cells look like this. I have the A antigen, I have the RH antigen in the membrane, so I'm A positive. Now, instead of memorizing all of these blood types, positives and negatives that everybody can receive, I need everybody to take out a pen or a pencil and write down these two statements. All right, and I'm gonna say it a couple okay. of times. Positive blood types can receive both positives and negatives of the blood types they can receive. I'll say it again. Positive blood types can receive both the positives and the negatives of the blood types they can receive. All right. Positive blood types can receive both the positives and the negatives of the blood types they can receive. So let's look at that. We already know the base blood types that everybody can get. A people can only get A and O. B can get B and O. A, B can get all of them and O can get O. Now we just have to put our little twist on it. A positive people. Let's see what they can get. A positive people, since they're A, they can still only get A and O. But since they're positive, they can get both the positives and the negatives of what they can already get. That means an A positive person can get A positive and A negative. O positive and O negative. You see, the base blood types don't change. They can only still get A and O, but now we just have to throw in the mix whether it's positive or negative. And as it turns out, the positive blood types can get both the positives and the negatives of what they can already get. So I'm A positive, I can receive four blood types. I can get A positive and A negative. I can get O positive and O negative. All right, not too bad, right? Same thing with B people. B people can only get B and they can only get O. Mm -hmm. You can't put any A blood in their body. They can't get A or AB. So on the base chart, B people can only get B and O. So if a person is B positive, that means they can get the positives and the negatives. So they can get B positive and B negative, O positive and O negative. So the base blood types don't change, right? Now, what about the negative blood types? Well, I need you to write this statement down. Negative blood types can only receive the negatives of the types of blood they can receive. I'll say it again. Negative blood types can only receive the negatives of the blood types they can already get, that they can already receive. So, go back to our base chart. What are the only blood types that A people can get? Well, A and O, right? So if someone is A negative, they can only get the negatives of those blood types. Mm -hmm. So they can get A negative and O negative. So an A negative person can only ever receive two blood types. Same thing with a B negative person. They can only ever receive two blood types. 
B negative, and O negative. So is everybody kind of clear on positive and negative? Yes. All right. Yes. Very good. Now, let's talk about AB. AB people can receive all of the blood types mm -hmm. on the base chart because they don't have these antibodies, right? right? And if you don't have the antibody, there's nothing to react to the antigens anyway to cause a transfusion reaction. So AB people can get A, they can get B, they can get AB, and they can get O. Including the negatives. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the positive first. Oh. What if you have somebody who is AB positive? AB positive people being positive can get both the positives and the negatives of what they can already get. Mm -hmm. And since they can already get all of them, that means AB positive people can receive A positive and A negative, B positive and B negative, AB positive and AB negative, O positive and O negative. Right. And since AB positive people can receive all eight blood types, they are referred to as the universal recipient. Because AB positives can receive all of them. Now, AB negative people are not the universal recipient. Even though the base blood type, they can receive all of them. Mm -hmm. AB negative people can only receive the negatives negative. of what they can already get. So AB negative people can receive A negative, B negative, AB negative, and O negative. So is everybody kind of understanding positives and negatives now? Yes. All right, very good. So what about O people? Well, O people can only receive O. Remember, they have both of the yes. antibodies. So you can't put A, B, or AB blood in their body because their antibodies will cause a reaction. They'll bind to all those antigens. It'll clump all the cells together, and you're going to kill them. Mm -hmm. So O people can only get O. So O positive people can receive two blood types. They can receive, o, go ahead, whoever said it. O, o positive and O negative. Very good. They can receive O positive and O negative. However, O negative people can only receive O negative. O negative. That's it. So here's the thing about O negative. All eight blood types can receive O negative. Everybody can receive O negative. A positive and A negative can get O negative. B positive and B negative can get O negative. AB positive and AB negative can get O negative. Mm -hmm. And then O negative can get O negative. So that's mm -hmm. why O negative is called the universal donor. Mm -hmm. Because O negative will never cause a reaction in the person's body. And for that reason, in the ER, if somebody's coming in and they're bleeding out and they're not going to make it, you don't have time to type their blood. So the doctor says, Give me six units of O neg stat. I'm sure you heard of that before, right? Either in a workplace if you're already working there or on a medical show. Why do they say give me units of O neg stat? Because they know that everybody can get O negative without hurting them. So that's why O negative is the universal donor. The only problem though is that O negative can give to everybody, but nobody can give to O negative except themselves. Only O negative can give the O negative. They can only receive O negative. But every one of these blood types can receive O negative. And that's why they are the universal donor. I remember, I, I remember that I heard that is the um, rarest type of blood, the O negative. Well, it's one of the rarest. It's, you know, it just depends. A, B negative, A, B positive or negative. I forget which one. The, the percentages of the blood types change depending on where we're at mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on what country we're in. Um, for our country, for the most part, O people are the most numerous, like O in general. Mm -hmm. But I think the majority of everybody who is O is O positive. So the, what you're talking about is that for blood donation. 
yeah. blood donation, we always have running low on O negative. So we, but it's hard to get people to go donate blood to begin with, much yes. less what is the percentage of the population of people that donate blood who are O negative, right? Yeah. So that's really what you're talking about. So the majority of the people in, in our country are type O. Mm. Um, type one of the rarest is AB negative, I think. Uh, mm. the, the second one, I think, is uh, there's a lot more A people than B people so forth and so on. Um, I don't remember the chart. There is a chart in your, in your lecture book. You can go look it up, but I think somewhere in Asia, there's a lot more B people than mm. A people, stuff like that. Um, but if you're interested in that, I think that unless they took it out of the new book, there used to be a chart in there, or you could just mm -hmm. Google it. You can see the chart yeah. online. I'm going to check. So what does the region have to do with your blood typing? Wait, say that again. No, I said, what does region where you came from have to do with the blood typing? It's because of the gene popu population, oh. the genes that are in the population. So the types of individuals with the types of genes that are accumulated in particular populations change over time and from one region to another one. So without getting into population genetics, and that's what you're really talking about, you have a spread of genes. So when, when people have children, they're putting their genes, the mom's genes and the dad's genes in that person. And so in our country, we have a lot more of the I genes in the population than we say the A or the B. That's why we have more O people than we do AB people, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's, it's called gene flow within a population. Um, and we don't really think about people being genetic reservoirs, but we are. Uh, and we disseminate those genes to our children. They then grow up and have children. They disseminate their genes. So it's just gene accumulation within a population. So that's all that is, Miss Amanu, if that's who was talking. Yeah, thank you. All right, you're welcome. All right, so yeah. the last thing that I want to talk about uh, before I go look up the pictures on blood typing is something called uh, agglutination. This is the test that we have to perform in order to type somebody's blood. So I want to explain to you what agglutination tests are, and then we're going to finish up with a little bit about hemolytic disease of a newborn, all right, and what that is. So... In order for you to determine the type of blood that somebody has, you have to know one thing, and that's it. You have to know what type of antigens are in the membrane of the red blood cell. That's what you have to determine. What type of antigens are present at the surface of the red blood cell? But the problem is, is you can't take somebody's blood and stick it on a microscope and look at it because we can't see this. Yeah, it looks like we would be able to see it. I didn't draw this to size. This is greatly enlarged relative to the size of the cell, right? Just so I can make an image out of it. So we cannot see these antigens under a microscope. So we have to do a chemical test in order to determine that. So, in order to determine what type of antigens are at the surface of the red blood cell, what you're really trying to do is cause an agglutination of all the red cells, which is a clumping of the cells together, which is exactly what I said we don't want to do inside of our body by giving somebody the wrong type of blood. Remember, I said you don't want to give somebody the wrong type of blood because we never want their antibodies reacting to their antigen. Remember that? Well, that's in your body. If you're trying to type somebody's blood, this is exactly what we want to happen. Because this is the only way that we can determine if that antigen is present. We want to try and make all of the cells clump together. This is the reaction we don't want to happen in our body, but this is a reaction that we want to happen or not happen in a test tube. So if you're trying to type somebody's blood, what you're gonna do is take a sample of their blood. You actually do three experiments. You take three little samples of the blood. You put them in little Petri dishes or test tubes, whatever you're testing it in, little trays. And in each one of the trays or test tubes, 
you're going to put an antibody, which is called an antiserum. So if you're trying to test for the A antigen, you need to treat that person's blood with the A, the anti-A antibody. So if I take somebody's unknown blood and put it in a test tube, then I put in that test tube these antibodies and I see all the cells start to clump together because that is something you can visually see. Once all the cells start to clump together, they fall out of solution and you start seeing the clear spots all in your tube. That's what we call a positive agglutination test. So if you end up with cells clumping together when you treated it with a particular antibody, you know that that antibody's antigen is present because that's the only way they can clump together. So I would take somebody's blood, three little samples, tube one, tube two, and tube three. In tube one, I would treat it with anti-A antibodies or what we call anti-A serum. In tube two, I would put anti-B antibodies. And in tube three, I would put anti-RH antibodies. You see, you can't put all the antibodies in one tube because you definitely will get some clumping together and you, you won't know what anti antigen's present. So you have to test for them separately. So in tube A, did I see clumping? Yep, I saw clumping. That means at least antigen A is present. And what did I say? If you have antigen A, you're at least type A. But you also have to test for the B antigen. So in tube two, you're going to take that same person's blood, you're going to put the anti-B antibodies in there, and you're going to look to see if everything clumps together. If you don't see any clumping together, which I'm going to use a science name from now on, it's called agglutination. If you don't see agglutination, it's called a negative agglutination test. I'm going to show you how you determine if it's negative in a minute, but you won't see little clear spots everywhere. The whole tube stays red and you know that's a negative test. So if I did a test on this person and I saw clumping in the tube A and no clumping in tube B, I know that person has the A antigen but not the B antigen and they're at least type A. Now, you would also have to test for the RH antigen to see if there's clumping or not or agglutination, but I didn't draw a little picture for that one. I just did it for these. So positive agglutination tests mean the cells clump together due to the treatment with the antibody. And negative agglutination, the cells stay flowing freely in the tube. They're not all clumped together from the antibody treatment, right? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna revamp on this in a second once I get done with HDN and hemolytic disease of a newborn. I only want you to know a little bit about this, but I want you to know the scenario about how it can come about. So first of all, hemolytic disease of a newborn is a blood disorder in the baby growing in utero in the mother. It's where, when it is afflicted in the baby, it's where the red blood cells agglutinate and they start to burst open and the baby's basically dying in the uterus while the baby's growing. So how, and it's not a 100% chance it happens, but there's a possibility. So how can that possibility come about? Well, the mother has to be one of the negative blood types. A positive blood type female will never, ever, ever, ever have this issue, ever. Only negative blood type females who become pregnant with positive blood type babies can potentially, potentially develop erythroblastosis fatalis or hemolytic disease of a newborn. And it works this way. When the baby is growing in utero, everybody should know that the mom's blood and the baby's blood never mixes. In other words, the mom's blood never goes into the baby's body, ever. However, 
at the time of delivery, when the placenta rips away from the uterine wall, there is some bleeding. There's a little bit of mixing of the baby's blood and the mom's blood. So herein lies the whole problem. And the reason why you never want to give a negative blood type person a positive blood type, by the way. It's the same scenario. If a positive blood type is introduced into a negative blood type person, in, the case, in, in this case, when the baby's blood, which is positive, mixes a little bit with the mom's blood at the wound when the placenta rips away from the uterus, the body starts to produce anti-RH antibodies. This is what we never want to happen. You never want somebody producing anti-RH antibodies. So if you give a negative blood type person a positive blood type, their body, their immune system is going to start producing anti-RH antibodies. That's bad. Not really then, but if they ever encounter positive blood type again, they could get very sick and potentially can die. So let's go back to the baby. The first baby goes to term. The first baby is delivered and the first baby is fine. There's no problem whatsoever. If the negative blood type mom did not get the drug called Rogam before and after delivery, and she delivers the RH positive baby, when the blood mixes, there is a possibility, it's not a 100% chance, but there is a possibility that the mom's immune system will become sensitized to the RH antigen, and she will for then ever produce anti-RH antibodies. Herein lies the whole problem. Once the mom's body starts to make anti-RH antibodies, those particular antibodies are of one of the five classes of antibodies we're gonna learn about. The one of the five classes of antibodies that can cross the placenta. That's the problem. Only one of the five classes can cross the placenta and the type of antibody that the anti-RH antibodies are, are that class. Those IgG antibodies can cross the placenta. So now if this negative uh, blood type female that is now producing anti-RH antibodies because her body was sensitized to her first baby's blood. Every subsequent baby, positive blood type baby she becomes pregnant with potentially can develop HDN. The very first baby's fine. It's all the subsequent babies that have positive blood types that can be hurt. And so what happens is, is the positive blood type baby, when the anti-RH antibodies from the mom's blood crosses the placenta and gets into the baby's blood, it starts to cause an agglutination reaction, which in the body is not called agglutination. It's called, I mean, you can call it that, but we call that really a transfusion reaction. So all the blood cells agglutinate together in the baby's body clogs up all of their blood vessels. The baby can stroke out. They can have uh, clogs in the arteries of the heart so the heart can stop. The baby can die in utero and be stillborn. That's the worst case scenario. In extreme cases, the baby can die. Now, I have had students in the past who said that their babies had this, but it was fairly mild. So this condition is not a 100% chance that it's gonna happen, by the way. But if it does happen, it can be to the mild to moderate end to the more severe end where the baby can die. And so what causes that? Well, the mom's body making these anti-RH antibodies that cross the placenta, get into the baby's blood and starts to cross link all of their cells together. Basically, the anti-RH antibody binds to the RH antigen on the baby's blood cell and clumps them all together and the baby's dying, right? That's called hemolytic disease of a newborn. So the only way that can come about is when a mom has a negative blood type. Positive blood type people 
will never ever produce anti-RH antibodies because then they, it, it would attack their own blood. So their bodies will never be sensitized, their immune system will never be sensitized to make anti-RH antibodies because they already have the RH antigen, it's theirs, it's not foreign, all right? All right, now, um, before you have uh, asked questions, let me pull up this real quick and we'll get back to that. Let me just finish with this. I wanna pull up a picture of blood typing. see where that was. Here's one. I wanted a different one though. Here it is. This picture I found has all eight blood types on it. So let me tell you what we're looking at. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because you're going to see data panels like this and you're going to have to determine what the blood type is. So I need to teach you how to do that. So first of all, in the first column over here, represents an untreated sample of somebody's blood. So if you take blood out of somebody's body, you put it in a little tray, but you don't treat it with anything, it's just gonna stay red like this. A smooth, red, pinkish color, right? So this represents, the even since it's untreated, would also represent a negative agglutination test. This is what a negative test would look like because none of the cells are clumping together. On the other hand, look what we have. So here's, here's individual one, patient number one. I'm trying to determine their blood type. I take their blood and I stick it in three little wells. I stick it in a well A, B, and RH, or it's often just called D. Boxes in the way. Oh, there it goes. So this D is another designation for RH antigen. It's called D, the D antigen. So don't, you don't need to worry about that. You can call it RH or D, it doesn't matter. But here's what you would do for patient one, two, three, four, all the way down. This is patient one's blood and all of these wells. And look, they look different. This one's red, this one's red, but these are all spotted. So what you do is you take this person's blood, you stick it in each one of these three wells. In the first well, I'm gonna put an anti-A antibody, which is referred to as anti-A serum. And if the A antigen is present, <coughs> excuse me, all of the anti-A antibodies are gonna clump all of the cells together. So look what happens when all the cells clump together or they agglutinate, that's what we call that. If they agglutinate, they get pulled out of solution. So you, you're left with all this clear area. See how it's not smooth red anymore? I just took this sample of blood, I stuck the A anti-A anti antibody in it, and now it looks like that. You know what that means? That the anti-A antibody had something to react to. It reacted with the A antigen on the surface of the red blood cell. So they all clumped together, and this is what a positive agglutination test is going to look like. And when you have a positive agglutination test for that particular antigen, you know that antigen is present. But we have to test for the other ones to get the total blood type. So at present, if I only did this one test, it would look like this person's type A because they have the A antigen. And I know that because I have a positive agglutination test in the A well. Now in the B well, I'm gonna stick anti-B antibodies, also called anti-B serum. I'm gonna stick it in the B well. I'm gonna let it sit there for a minute. And all of a sudden I go, yep, there's no reaction because the cells didn't clump together. It's still just a smooth red, just like an untreated sample. This means that this is a negative agglutination test for the B antigen. So that tells me there's no B antigen. However, in the third well, the same person's blood, 
I stick an anti-RH antibody or an anti-RH or anti-D serum. It's called D because that's the, des the other designation for this type of antigen. So I stick the anti-D antibody, anti-RH antibody in this well. All of a sudden, yep, I see clumping. There's agglutination. That means that's a positive agglutination test right there. So this tells me that the RH antigen is present. So you know what kind of blood type this person has? Yeah, A positive. A positive, very good. So if we have the A antigen and we have the RH antigen, we said earlier that means that's A positive. We'll look at person number two. They had a negative reaction on A, but positive for B and positive for RH. B positive. Hey, B positive, you're gonna make a good grade. Get it? B positive? All right. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I, I, it I prefer A than B, but okay. <laughs> B positive, there you go. All right, so the third person, look what they have. They had a, a positive agglutination in the A well, the B well, and the RH well. That means they have all three of the antigens. So this person is A, B positive. So that's how you read these things. You can go online and pull these pictures up if you want. You can, you know, take a screenshot of this one if you want. It has all eight blood types on it. Go ahead. Um, is this the same, um, the same chart that's provided in our modules as well? It as is, well. but I don't know if they have all eight blood types. I think it's just oh, a, okay. it, I think it's just a sample. So you might have this one, you might have that one, and this one or that one. Okay, because I saw one in um, the modules that says- Yeah, there, there should be one in the, oh, the one I posted in the module, I forget which one that was, um, but it was a chart like this, right? Um, yeah, it looks but, similar to that, yes. Yeah, but and you should- like the little, the little blood, um, uh, the little blood cells and Samples, stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you could learn it off of that chart as well if you want, you know? Um, on the practical, they're going to show you these. That, oh, by the way, these are not individual blood cells as well, right? There's a whole bunch of blood cells in here. So these are little wells that have, you know, drops of somebody's whole blood in it. So at any rate, you need to be able to determine the blood type from an agglutination test like this. Like on the practical, they'll show you, say, this one, right? Or they'll show you this one, whatever the case may be. These are the only eight types that you could ever encounter. So as long as you could tell the positive from a negative test, and you know positive means the antigen is present, you'll be able to determine anybody's blood type by looking at the data, right? For instance, this person right here, person five. We have a negative A, a negative B, but a positive RH. What blood type is that? Was it O positive? O positive. O positive. Very good. If you don't have A and you don't have the B antigen, but you have the RH antigen, you're O positive. All right. All right. Um, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen.